This is really bad. The following broadcast is brought to you by Pat, the Gordon Center of Thought. Here only on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Every Saturday, 9 to 10 p.m. Join us on the dark side of radio. Agora, Anarchy, Action. Yes, 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 this is the Agora Underground. I am Comrade Dick, sitting here with Darian. What's going on, guys? What's going on, man? Thanks Thank for tuning in. Um, Definitely. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, again, this is the Agora Underground in the free association with uh, Free San Antonio and Agora Central Texas, throwing it down also with We Are Change, several chapters here in, in Texas, and uh, just, um, you know, extending anarchy to you here yeah, again, Saturday. Uh, reaching every Saturday. out to you, reaching out to you with the with anarchist uh, open, open palms. <laughs> yeah, every Saturday, uh, 8 to 9 p.m. here on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Do appreciate you guys tuning in, and uh, basically this is uh, a show about agorism and how it ties into anarcho-capitalism. Well, I know there's a lot of confusion as to what agorism actually is, and we've just been reading uh, Konkin's primer on on agorism, and essentially just breaking it down. I mean, and as we covered last week in Applied Economics, we read that chapter. Uh, from what we read, you know, uh, out of Konkin's mouth himself, he uh, stands up for. The Mycian, the Austrian school of economics, right? The uh, he stands up for sound economic principles, whether it's uh, you know <clears throat> beginning with money, right? The medium of exchange required to have uh, higher ends of production, everything to that, from to rent and uh, you know price theory and everything. I mean, he talked about it all, so it was really good stuff. And uh, so this week we're getting into kind of the uh, the means by which an agora society can be achieved, right? A, a voluntary stateless society can be achieved, and that's counter economics. And get, getting into, we're going to be reading that and just breaking it down here for you guys. Uh, again, this is in the primer. You can also uh, get it on a download on your phone. Uh, so you can see that's what I've been doing over here. Uh, just making sure. <laughs> Everybody's probably like, uh, is that guy texting while on the show? <laughs> yeah, right. So chapter three, counter-economics. We see that nearly every action is regulated, taxed, prohibited, or subsidized. Much of the statism, for it is only the state which wields such power, is so contradictory that little ever gets done. If you cannot obey the state's laws and charge less than, more than, or the same as your competitor, what do you do? Do you go out of business or do you break the law? Supposing paying your taxes would drive out, drive you out of business, do you go out of business, or do you break the law? And that's a pretty good uh, point to bring in, right? I mean, when 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 rules and regulations, status regulations, which is is uh, Ayn Rand so uh, you know adequately pointed out in uh, Atlas Shrugged, uh, right? The bureaucrat told the uh, Reed and Steel right guy um, told them like basically you know why we make laws we don't make laws so that pe they can be kept and you know we can have a virtuous society we make laws in order to, to for y'all to break them or else we wouldn't have any power over society right so they use regulation and laws in order to justify their revenue intake because the only power the state has is to deal with criminals and crime and so you make everything illegal <laughs> right <laughs> and how can we have businesses when everything's illegal you can't so really the question is is do you Follow this regulation, which is going to make you into a turn us into a serf, turn this into a you know a, a what is it a stand in line for ten hours to get you know some cheese and stand in line for ten days to get a, a cast on your broken arm, or are we gonna are we gonna let the agora grow? You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. Right, right. So it continues on here. Government laws have no intrinsic relationship with right and wrong or good and evil. Historically, most people knew that the royal edicts war for the king's good, not theirs. People went along with the king because the alternative looked worse. This line of thinking leads to chapter 5. So we will just note here that even today society recognizes the conscientious objector, the religious dissenter, to laws that his de deity forbids him to obey. 
the man or woman who follows the law of God or nature against the monopoly of force in society. Since they would rather die than submit a society which restrains its government from heavy repression will exempt many objectors. And uh, that's very, I mean, that's there's some good points right there. I mean, uh, they have no standard by which they pass laws, right? There is no standard. There is no principle when it comes to the state. The state is uh, very akin to popery in a lot of ways, right? I mean, uh, do it because the pope said so, right? The priest said so. I mean, it's it's basically an old religious, right? Uh, yeah, like, I mean, uh, I mean, isn't that the first step of uh, br like breaking down like uh, into like a making a cult? Like, you know, being like, oh, well, you know, let's get everybody to submit, like, uh, you know, <laughs> under just one philosophy, uh, go out there and fight this war because we told you to. You're in the army. I'm above you. That's right. Uh, came from higher powers. Fight yeah. for God, son. God and country. Yeah, 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 yeah. And with, um, on the side of here, no, I mean, yeah, that's that's exactly right, man. We, we, we put it on the, the state on a pedestal and we, we worship it. I mean, we just finished the 4th of July. This is what, July 5th, right? Oh, that, that, uh, that's like a... We did the 4th of July weekend. That, I mean, that's the birthday of their God, man. Uh, yeah, people waving flags and shooting off, uh, blowing up their money, you know, hard-earned labor yeah, just know, to uh, celebrate uh, the loss of uh, Bottle rockets and uh, your cheap beer bottles and then your friend's butt cracks, apparently. Have you ever seen that freaking video? Oh, uh, yeah, dude. Uh, but, it's um, ridiculous, man. I mean, and, and uh, they think that uh, the freedom and liberty is still alive, and when it is actually not, it is very much out the window. And uh, I think it's time for anarchy to start uh, start moving in. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. All right, well, um, I'm, I'm going to start off uh, right here. Where were you at? Doo -doo. Well, I was going to say, um, you know, they have no, uh, with with the uh, onset, I mean, it's like, it's so interesting, like, you, it really makes me wonder, like, who is our greatest ally as anarchists and as agorists in the political spectrum, and we really have none. Like, at first you might think, oh, maybe the small government conservative or the constitutional Republican is our closest ally. Or the, or but, the Tea Party. But, or right, or the Tea Party or something like know. that. But then when you realize that they really do put uh, the Constitution on the level, on par with the, with the you know, it's the like their Bible. It's the, like, you know, God the Ten really, Commandments. Yeah, the founding fathers. And we even use the term fathers, which is interesting enough, you know, uh, for the founders of this nation. I mean, oh, yeah. They, they, kind they, of like they, that double, double speak right there going on. Have you ever uh, noticed the difference between, like, uh, nations when they call their land the fatherland or the... Or the motherland. Or uh, the motherland. I mean, uh, the Germans called their, their uh, country the fatherland. But, um... We're gonna continue right here, folks. Uh, with well, yeah. Well, no. But I was gonna say, like, it's like, how do we get rid of um, who's that? They're gonna be our greatest enemy in in the long run because they believe that the state is in, intrinsically like placed there by deity, by the divine nature. You know, how are we gonna get rid of that? At least with the socialists, we can convince them after like evidence and like just you know actually showing them the ex the re repercussions of their choices of their status choices. But with this. With a right winger, I mean, I just, I just don't know how that's gonna, you know, at uh, least a religious right winger. Right, like, uh, I mean, I've talked to a, a lady before, and she was uh, trying to push the Constitution, but she was like a, a Christian because she was out there handing out flyers to people uh, for church, and I say, you know, a, a true Christian uh, doesn't vote, and then she was like, what? <laughs> like what? Like voting is a uh, the the greatest power that we can have as a free, as a free people. And I was all like, a joke. as a free people to vote, like to vote for someone to be in charge of them. That's not very free, ma'am. Yeah. And I was telling her that uh, if you're a true Christian, you don't want to like uphold, uh, um, you know, like such a power that steals and murders, you know. Yeah. Uh, and she was just like blown away with that. Uh, but that statement because like completely just like reversed everything that she that she believes in. Yeah, I mean, are you gonna follow Jesus or are you gonna follow the state, right? For for you Christian for you Christian listeners, I might be interested in what this anarchy stuff is and the Zagora stuff is, right? And yeah. we, and you I, you know that obviously because you're listening. But this is something we have to pose to Christian people out there is you know, that's a that's a wide uh, group of people, a lot of followers of a, of a pacifist of an anarchist. And so we need to be familiar with uh, Jesus' words and, you know, where to quote the Bible and, and show them that, uh, you know, hey, they need to be anarchists and pacifists like their their Savior was, you know I mean? Um, 
McConkin continues here, but everyone is a resistor to the extent that he survives in a society where laws control everything and give co contradictory orders. All non-coercive human action committed in defiance of the state constitutes the counter-economy. For ease of later analysis, we exclude murder and theft, which are done with the, the disapproval of the state. Since taxation and war encompass nearly all cases of theft and murder, the few, uh, except for few independent acts, should really be classified as other forms of statism, or just aggressionism, right? The the red the red market. Um, I don't know if you guys will post the. Uh, I'll post a link to it on the YouTube video. But uh, there's a chart that you know sh shows the black market, the gray market, the white market, and the uh, the red and pink markets, and um, and you know uh, red and pink being a uh, you know, either directly as a result of criminal activity, aggression. Actually, with I, I think that chart is on the on the Free San Antonio page. Yeah. Uh, um, I might have posted that one up. Yeah. Um. So the red is like aggression, and then pink is subsid subsid you know subsidized businesses that have to do that are getting money obviously off aggression. Um. But those aren't really market factors, right? We know that. I mean, when someone steals something from you, that wasn't a market exchange. That was a, a criminal act. So this is a, this is a good point here that um, everything that is illegal by the state that is voluntary right that is non-coercive is part of the counter economy. <clears throat> um, since anything the state does and not license or approve of is forbidden or prohibited, there are no third possibilities. A counter economist is one anyone practicing a counter economic act, and two one who studies such acts counter economics as the a practice or B study of counter economic acts. Uh, the size of the counter economy. The counter economy is vast. Our brief study of economics tells us that this should be no surprise. The more controls and taxation a state imposes on its people, the more they will evade and defy them. Since the United States is one of the less officially controlled countries and the counter economy here is fairly large, the global economy should be expected to be even larger, and it is on the global economy. Yeah, there was an article uh, recently, uh, and constantly, right, um, by Business Insider and all these economic analysis uh, magazines and all this, pointing out that the uh, black market worldwide, I mean, is is the you know most likely the top one of the top three, you know, as far as the uh, size of and scope of it, uh, you know. I mean that's huge. That's huge. That's a lot of revenue. That's a lot of uh, market transactions. Grant, granted. Um, be interesting to find out if they're considering coercive or non-coercive acts in that in that statistic as well. But corporate, I mean, the corporate subsidies right now are just like going through the roof. I mean, everywhere you see is a is some sort of company, you know, subsidized. Yeah, big time. Um, so U.S. government estimates that the size of just the tax dodging part of the counter economy is twenty or forty million of the population. 20 to 40 million of the population, and, and I mean, how high is that now? You know, how many people don't actually pay into taxes? Or I'm not talking about state employees. I'm talking about just people that make money under, under the table. I mean, yeah. Uh, Western European country uh, counter economy. Uh, I'm sorry, Western European counter economy is larger. In Italy, much of the civil services uh, services sits in government offices during the early part of the day, and then moonlights at private jobs and businesses in the afternoon and evening. Communism collapsed in no small part due to the counter economy. Nearly everything was available in the counter economy with only shoddy goods and shortages in the official social eco socialist economy. The Soviets called the counter economic goods left hand or nele nelevo, nelevo. Nele yeah, nelevo, nelevo and Entire manufacturing assembly lines coexisted Nalavo with the desultory state industry ones on the same factory floor. Counter economic capitalists sh sold shares in their companies and vacation in the. Um, well, I should have. That button wasn't there. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, that's that's pretty neat. I mean, the fact that uh, the whole that's that's something to research definitely. I think there's like a little bit of, of knowledge on that, but I mean, yeah, I mean, people would have just starved to death, and a lot of, a lot of people did. But I'm sure 
the counter economy yeah. was was thriving in in communist Russia as it is probably in, in communist China. You know, yeah. at the moment, I mean, how many people are trading goods and services without the, uh, you know, the authorities and the and well, the, the, the party I mean, finding out? Yeah, of course they probably gotta like you know have a lot of like human interaction with as far as trading goods because if you look around, there's not a whole lot of uh, uh, stores and 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 open markets there. I mean, it depends on I guess where you go, but I've seen parts of Russia that are like almost broken down, like almost like some Detroit, <laughs> way Detroit's going, and um, I mean, they, they would have to in order to get some sort of a uh, service. Right, right. So uh, counter-economic uh, capitalists sold shares in their companies and vacation in the Black, in Black Sea resorts. Managers of collective farms who needed a tractor replaced in a hurry Look to the counter economy rather than uh, see their coal cost. collapse. Coal costs uh, collapse awaiting a state tractor delivery. Currently, the Russian government seeks to reestablish state control of the economy by granting monopolies to cronies and imprisoning re uh, recalcitrant. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Uh, I don't even think I've seen that word in my life. Recalcitrant. I guess rebellious, yeah. right? Corporate executives. As with communism, this flirtation with fascist, fascism is just as doomed to failure. Well, and, and Hayek pointed out that uh, fascism is just the um, inevitable result of a failed socialism. I mean, once the country realizes that the welfare state and the handout system and that uh, you know this this form of collectivism didn't work, uh, they quickly switch over to the other form of collectivism, right? Uh, fascism, where it's a militarized state, and where we, you know, we subsidize everything, industry, in order to um, to stimulate it, versus you know the government managing everything. So, <clears throat> I mean, it's just it's just the the coin. T it's the back and forth, you know, like hot potato. Yeah. Pass the grenade around and well, one, we'll see one, who it blows one, up. One uh, dictator to leader to tyrant to president. <laughs> you know, it's just we're we're trading all these. Uh, these different forms of uh, rule rulers, and we're just calling them different things. I mean, pass that hot potato to the people once in a while and see how they they do on their own. Yeah, right. Definitely. I mean, they, they don't want to do that. So nothing. Uh, and this is a pretty neat sentence. Uh, nothing works in right hand communism. Everything works in left hand free market. Right? Nothing works when the state's running everything and we follow the state orders and the state regulations, but everything works when we do it through the free market, right? Spontaneously yeah. through anarchy. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> it's like, what? Like, uh, yeah, of course, because uh, y'all are uh, ruling a bunch of people. If you, if there's no uh, nobody there on, on, the, you know, on the left side to rule and, and regulate, so it's more prosperous as far as, you know, like businesses can grow. And uh, people can thrive. Yeah. Uh, so, from black market apartments in the Netherlands to black housing in Argentina, the counter economy is well known to the people of the world as the place to get things otherwise unobtainable or keep things one has earned. Inflation breeds flight from fiat money. Exchange controls have created dual exchange rates in nearly every country on the globe. Whatever the number of local currency units a tourist can get for his dollars at the official exchange rate, he or she can get more on the black market. Smuggling is so commonplace that nearly all tourists slip purchases past customs agents without thinking. Perhaps 20 to 30 percent of Americans fail to report taxable income. Eventually, nearly 100 percent fail to report at least some. <laughs> wow. But in Latin American countries, close to 80 percent go uncollected and the state supports itself by ever greater inflation of the fiat money supply. The border between Hong Kong and communist China and even the ocean straits between Taiwan and the mainland bustle with illegal trade. Western DVDs and jeans were once illegally available in most provinces of China. Now they're manufacturing them there. Saigon renamed, re renamed Ho Chi Minh City remains the black market center of Vietnam. Even more telling, it produces most of the goods and services of all Vietnam. Myanmar's 
and Burma's rigidly controlled official economy, according to the Manchester Guardian, is nothing but paper, and the entire market has gone black. Under the noses of the American forces, Afghani tribes grow, process, and ship heroin by the metric ton. Some uh, I, some I, I, don't know, I don't know that, about under their noses. Yeah, I mean through, uh, through their noses, <laughs> right through their noses, <laughs> and uh, they got a little cut off uh, from from the uh, from the terrorists, so-called terrorist groups. You know, when they're protecting their their fields, yeah, right under their noses, yeah, right under their feet. <laughs> yeah. Tax evasion, inflation, avoidance, smuggling, free production, and illegal distribution still compose only half of the counter economy. Labor flows as freely as capital, as hordes of, of illegal aliens pour across the border from more status to less status economic regions. Imagine how many Americans are going to be hoarding out of, this, of, of America whenever we collapse. <laughs> it's just all like, quick, go to Mexico. Yeah, straight up. Uh, I wonder if they'll put Canada's going to be shooting at Americans crossing the border. Right, they're going to be like, oh, all these illegal Americans. Yeah. Taking out jobs. Taking eh? jobs, eh? <laughs> uh, consciousness altering substances and even unproven medicines such as dichlor.
in the boat. Anyways, uh, we're back. That was commercial break. <laughs> As you can tell, we don't have. Yeah, I think we're back now. Sorry, I mean, I don't know what's going on, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, we got. I don't know. It happened on this happened on our first episode, and we're really sorry about that. And uh, it was just a little slight commercial break there. Um, everything just shut down just for for y'all's curiosity. But um, we were just talking about conscious altering drugs. It's like we have a uh, broadcast altering uh, NSA working on us. So, uh, conscious altering substances. And even unproven medicines such as diglossarate and layer trial make up well-known but small fractions of the counter economy. Drugs are grown on huge plantations, refined in scores of factories and laboratories, distributed by fleets of boats, planes, trucks, and cars, and sold by customers by uh, regiments of wholesalers and armies of street dealers. The state's imposition of some people's moral codes on other leads to Bible smuggling in atheist states and pornography publishing in conservative religious states. The world's oldest profession, sexual prostitution, has been titled is also, if that title is true, the world's oldest counter-economic industry. Feminists seeking to control their own bodies look to the counter-economy to obtain contraceptives and find midwives to deliver babies their way in the counter economy. Nobody works at anything anywhere which is not connected with counter economics. Those looking for a more ex exhaustive listing of counter economic activities with all the sources and references footnoted are invited to read this author's upcoming book, which unfortunately he never came out with. Uh, it's supposed to be like a whole encyclopedia to counter economics. <laughs> um, but you know, some uh, there's like, I mean, how many jobs are counter economic? I mean, uh, babysitting, you know, uh, do some uh, auto mechanic, you know, do some mechanical work, do some yard services, uh, painting, electrical work, uh, we you know, tiling, like, yeah, and you don't even have to like bust your bust your uh, you know back. You can do things that are, uh, you know, exchanging things of value, like, like, uh, yeah. I mean. So uh, people jailbreak phones too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean I'm everything pretty, is. I'm pretty sure most uh most uh Mexican business, Mexican run, you know, like uh, uh they, they come over here and work. I'm pretty sure most of their businesses uh they don't even pay their taxes or anything. Yeah, right. Everything uh is paid under the table with them. So he goes on here to information. Two counter-economic industries are singled out for their importance to accord them. Justice is a commodity. Its manner of distribution defines a social system and will be covered in detail in Chapter 7. The other business is, is in information. The Internet explosion has led to the American state, has led the American state, for now, at any rate, to throw up uh, its tentacles at regulation of the information industry. Every legislation session, however, brings new attempts to tax and control the World Wide Web. But consider this well. Should the counter economy lick the information problem? It would virtually eliminate the risk it incurs under the state's threat. That is, if you can advertise your products, reach your consumers, and accept payment, a form of information, all outside the detection capabilities of the state, what enforcement of control would be left? The leading edge of web development today is encryption. Advanced researchers have developed methods of locking away data and memory banks that defy any breaking in. That is, the state cannot reach the invoices, inventory lists, accounts, and so on of the counter economists. An area of human society immune to the power of the state deserves the name, if anything does, of anarchy. The state, though... Word of the, day. the state, uh, you're right... The state, though, continues to attempt to penetrate privacy with quantum computing methods of cracking even the most complex encrypt and cryptographic schemes. Will the counter economy respond with quantum cryptography? Stay tuned. The race is hardly at its end. This leads us to two crucial questions. What happens if the state is abolished and we have a free market? 
And why has the counter economy not overwhelmed the existing economy already? These questions bring us back to the land of theory where libertarianism answers the first question and agorism the second. Before we deal with them, however, let us consider some applications of counter-economic business practices and social interactions, which will be both illustrated and uh, will both illustrate our descriptions and possibly be some of uh, some profit to you and yours. Yeah, yeah. So he gets here into the next chapter, uh, counter-economics applied, right? Uh, applied counter-economics, chapter four. Well, you want me to try to read this off, man? Uh, it's up to you, man. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take it. Um, applied counter economics. Counter economics is application. People have discovered and acted in a counter economic way without understanding that they are doing why they are doing it and even denying that they are doing it at all. Understanding that you uh, are doing usually helps in applying counter economic systems. Um, systematically, sorry about that, and consistently maximizes both your formula is no more do, um, difficult than simple counts. Well, uh, consistently maximizes both your profit and freedom. Oh, sorry about that. And as it turns out, the basic formula is no more difficult than simple count. Um, damn. Accounting, well, arithmetic, yeah, arithmetic used in all, in all business. business. The basic law of counter economics is to trade risk for profit. Having done so, one naturally acting to remove felt unease attempts to reduce the risk. If you reduce your risk while others continue to face the higher risk, you are naturally out compete.
Lordy, lordy. It happened again. Really sorry about that. Again, uh, we're going to get this figured out for next time. We got green screens coming in, and, you know, we're just doing a crappy job right now. So, um, But trying to read through through this, hopefully the... Uh, Computer doesn't decide that uh, it's a it's a state is. I should have bought I should have bought this laptop on the counter economy. I knew it. <laughs> Let me down. Yeah, it was uh, built by the state. It rejects any uh, agoras to talk. Or wait, or, or did I or did I buy on the counter economy? Oh crap! <laughs> no man. <laughs> I, I don't know nothing about that. Yeah. Can't came off the, off the back of a truck. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So we were you just finishing up reading Darian how uh, basically um, what uh, basically we have to reduce risk um, that counter economic activity comes with risk, right? This is the reason most people are turned off by uh, agorism, right? And the means to achieve it is uh, people are like, well, you know, essentially they're they're bringing up the issue of state regulation and can't the state come in and find me and you know. Take me to the jail, all right? Kidnap me and throw me in a cell. Like, can't you know? Can I get fined? Can I get in trouble? And I mean, this is, I mean, this is what freedom costs, right? I mean, freedom it isn't free, and you know, not to take that status slogan, but I mean, it isn't. It involves uh, having to fight for it, and sometimes yeah, you even, take a lot uh, of risk. Yeah, taking some risk. So, so obviously, being involved in counter economics, um, you want to minimize that risk and. And the internet and encryption are are definitely doing that. I mean, how many vendors on the net, right, uh, selling goods and services, you know, through without the state finding out about it? I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, a lot a lot of businesses uh, take uh, take the risk, you know, accepting Bitcoin. Yeah, well, I mean, that's well, it's not even really a risk, right, at the moment. I mean, well, I mean, it is. I mean, it could potentially be a big risk if the government decides to. Oh yeah, well it's booming, and when it booms, you know they're gonna be like, oh snap, they figured it out. They can, they can have another another way of uh, of exchange. And yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sure like Newegg and stuff like that. I mean, I'm sure they have to. And op- what is it, Overstocked? I'm, they've been accepting Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, well, Newegg just recently started too, but I'm sure the government's going to ask for their transaction. You know, their personal. They have to pay taxes on that. I'm sure. Yeah, they're gonna have to. Unless they don't pay tax, unless they don't have to, because they're big enough, right? They're too big to fail, and they're part of the crony, crony class. <laughs> right. The cronyism. Um, so we were just reading about that, the risk. I don't know if you want to continue on. Uh, yeah, man, I was kind of having a little bit of trouble because uh, these these were. All right, it's so all good. It's all good. So, uh, what's what's the risk? And it it is possible to make a reasonable estimate of the risk you are taking in counter-economic activity, which is better precision than many businesses' ventures offer. The government itself gathers statistics concerning apprehension of criminals and publishes them. The police agencies brag about how few cases are solved and how fast the crime rate is growing to justify ever bigger budgets. Nonetheless, most crimes go completely unreported and undetected, so the state's stats are an upper limit of apprehension. That is, their figures are useful as maximum risk. The highest apprehension rate for the most foul crimes seldom hit 20%, an indication of government effectiveness in maintaining public order. And I did did a recent survey on this, uh, homicide. Uh, 50% of homicides are solved. I mean, the two, you know, you, you got a good chance that one of them isn't going to be solved. I mean, and we're counting on these guys to protect us, and without the state, murder's going to go rampant? Give me a break. But I think the real problem is the prevention of these crimes. Like, it's like, all, it's like yeah, you know, murder's through the roof. It's just like, yeah, because you're, you're there once they're murdered, you, you know, didn't help in any way, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a very good economic uh, point. With the that the market offers incentive to, um, uh, for you know, uh, what do you call it? Not for like dealing with the fact after the you know after the crime or dealing with the disease after you get the disease, yeah. but with with preventative uh, care, right? I mean, if you a market um, invest, someone's going to have your health insurance. It's going to say, well, we'll give you a deduction if you don't smoke, and we'll give you a deduction if you work out, and we'll give you a deduction if you eat healthy, Yeah. right? There's those market incentives to, to, to stop, you know, 
to prevent uh, disease from even happening. Whereas with the Obamacare, it don't matter. It don't matter how how fat you are. You're gonna get you know how much you eat. You know if you eat burgers every day and you don't you could care less. There's no market incentive there right. um, to stop right because you you don't have to pay for it. So is it like if there were prevention agencies to like you know like uh, to prevent or you know uh, people from eating uh, fast food fast bu uh, food businesses would you know probably you know. Go out of style, man. I mean, everybody's well, trying to eat healthy. Had to, exactly. People had to pay, actually pay unless you, for their Unless you want to eat that, that greasy, you know, uh, steroid en enhanced meat, then uh, you can go ahead. Yeah, right. And I mean, and what bigger, um, and then uh, Hope, right? Uh, Von Hope uh, from the Mighty's Institute, right? A uh, good friend of Rothbard. I mean, he pointed out in his uh, The Myth of National Defense how. Um, security agencies would be uh, the, the incentive there is to stop crime from even happening, right? Versus now with security with the cops, it's 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 uh, persecution, as you said, right? Yeah. It's pers it's persecuting the criminal after the crime has been committed, whereas uh, uh, you know security agencies going to want to make sure to prevent murder from happening, even happening, or prevent uh, theft from happening, right? Because mm -hmm. they have to pay out of pocket for those. Uh, for that, for that material, for those that kids, little right? motto that they live off of, you know, uh, when we come save the day, it's like, oh yeah, you know, uh, this guy needed you to to save him, but now he's dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, what are you gonna save a uh, save his soul or something afterwards? <laughs> right. So, is it worth it? Suppose you wish to do something counter-economic. To be specific, you can buy something for ten thousand dollars and sell it for twenty thousand. Your regular overhead is five thousand dollars. Your net return on the investment is five thousand dollars. On an investment of fifteen thousand, that is thirty-three percent. That is extremely high. But since there is a risk, how can you tell if the return is worth it? Let's say the government claims to catch twenty percent of those doing what you want to do. If you were caught, the penalty would be a maximum fine of fifty thousand dollars, or six months in jail. Your downsize risk then is 20% of 50000 or $10,000 in this example. It would not be worth it to gain, uh, what is it, $5,000, but risk losing 10000 right? It's not worth it. If the apprehension rate were 10% and the fine 25000 then your risk would be of uh, 2500 for a gain of 5000 as is obvious, you could get caught one time in 10, pay off your fines, and still come out ahead. Of course, all these calculations make certain assumptions about your subjective values. You may fear risk uh, to the pathological state of any risk is too much. Or you may love frustrating the state and make high risks for lower gains just for the fun, fun of it. <laughs> just for the what? Just for the what of it? Just for the fun of it. Actually, well, we can say fuck on it. Yeah, we can. Okay, awesome. Actually, a more realistic risk estimate would include the price of a lawyer to beat your charges, and the probability of being convicted after apprehension. Assume that the retainer to your lawyer raises you your overhead a thousand per transaction. Now your your payoff is four thousand, but the conviction rate. Which, uh, with plea bargaining and court delays, is only twenty thousand or twenty percent. I'm sorry. Again, that is high in many jurisdictions. Many cases are dropped long before they come to trial. Now, your risk using our first figures is twenty percent off twenty percent of fifty thousand or two two thousand dollars, with a payoff of four thousand of loss of two thousand would deter few entrepreneurs. If you like a simple formula for your own business, try this. So you basically the the algorithm here that Konkin gives us as a uh, as a setup here. He's basically counter economic payoff. So what your um, equals profit minus loss, right? And promise price minus cost minus overhead minus penalty or fine times probability of arrest times probability of conviction. If positive, go for it. If negative, don't do it. We wouldn't suggest you doing it. Uh, so lowering risks. Taking reasonable steps to conceal your activities from accidental discovery. Learning to talk only 
to trusted friends, spotting poor risks or government agents all reduce your risk and increase your profit. As you develop techniques to lower your risk, you will increase your counter-economic activities. More of them become profitable. These side effects include the creation of an agorist society. More of that in Chapter 7. Counter-economizing. While it is true that you cannot obey all the inconsistent laws of the state and so be completely white market, you can live, com you can live completely counter-economically and be completely black market. In the middle 1970s, the federal state passed a regulation imposing a minimum speed limit on U.S. highways of 55 miles per hour. With the threat of cutting federal funds to state and counties, the entire driving population decelerated to a creeping crawl. Or did it? Consider the following calculation. 55 miles per hour, a truck driver can do 55 miles an hour. That's 550 miles in 10 hours and 2,200 miles in 40 hours. At an average of 70 miles per hour, he makes 700 miles in 10 hours and 2,800 miles in 40 hours. To make that even clearer, assume that the trucker nets $1,000 after cost for each 600-mile run. He makes four runs legally for $4,000 in an easy week, or $5,000 by extending his hours or working weekends. At 70 miles per hour, he makes $5,000 roughly for just for the 40-hour week. With that type of incentive, the race went to the swift and the double nickel. Speed limit was scoffed at. But being caught and fined would wipe out the advantage. Suppose fuel were consumed at the rate that the cost of, of that extra 200 at a higher speed and you received an average fine of $200, four bus a week, and it's no longer worth it. Along came citizen band radio. Put 200 or 400 once into a CB radio investment, reduce your bus to once a week, and you're back in business. And that, of course, is what happened. Truckers spotted for each other, formed convoys, and thwarted the state's smoky bear highwaymen. Consider the, f the side effects. Truckers found solidarity economically, culturally, and anti-politically. A CB culture exploded into the popular culture with C.W. McCall's classic song, Convoy. Non-truckers who were willing, willing to buy a CB and learn the culture, especially the language, were accepted freely into the ordered highway anarchy. More evasion of regulations followed and the counter economy grew. Truckers, many of them conservative with a conservative upbringing, became considerably more tolerant and willing to help other lawbreakers, in quotations, right? Uh, quote, quote, unquote. Yeah. Uh, when their common enemy, Smokey, threatened them. My little buddy named Smokey. <laughs> Got Smokey Bear on the West West West, West Cop Watch, right? When, when you... Uh, when you set up a sign and there's a speed trap and you you know you you have a sign um, or even just f flickering your lights right at people when there's a cop down you know a mile down the ways because oh, yeah. they're speeding too fast or uh, you know bl uh, blink your lights twice uh, to let someone know their lights on or off. Yeah, right, right, right. But I'm talking about to avoid the you know the police like like people like oh that's avoiding like, the police. So much. Oh yeah, yeah, they'll, pull you, right, they'll, yeah. Pull, they'll, they'll pull you over for not I, having your lights on. I at forgot. Night. Yeah, I forgot they'll pull you over for just. They'll pull you anything. over for uh for practically anything. Yeah. You don't have your seatbelt. You're endangering yourself, and I can uh, impose my authority. Tell you to keep safe. It's like uh. But keep things... keep eating our uh, keep eating our subsidized Monsanto crud. Yep. Do it. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. The CB explosion is not meant here to be a model in the sense of waiting around for the state to trigger off mass rebellion by an ingridiously ingri stupid law. This is another one of those words. This happened to be a particularly spectacular case, but no more than the sudden jump in counter-economics when prohibition was passed in the 1920s or when the draft led to two-year slavery and possible death in 1964. And the state does not learn from its mistakes, as recent efforts to reimpose the 55 mile per hour limit, as well as reactivate the draft, arise again.
Yeah, who was that? Uh, some New York representative from New York State wanted to, you know, call in to bring back the the draft. I mean, uh, isn't that pretty much what Selective Services is? Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, I mean, go get, turn eighteen. I didn't sign up for that shit. I don't know. I already knew what it was. I was like, uh, nope. Well, back in the day, that that's why they had a uh, baby baptism. This is why th that was promoted so heavily. Original sin and baby baptism, because it gave the state that senses of how many boys are being born, what year they were born in, and when they would be uh, old enough to fight in war. Hmm. You know, pretty simple. I mean, <laughs> right? Gotta get them baptized first. And then promoting that they're evil, inherently evil, actually like uh, calms the conscience of having to go slaughter people. Right? You're just you're just yeah. an evil baby, you know. So it's your and your, it's <laughs> it's your nature it's to it's be it. a barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> It's like it's it's okay. You're fine. You're fine for God and country, son. Right. Do God proud, and by God I mean the state. Yeah, yeah. So we're just finishing up here. Um, uh, counter economizing yourself. Finishing up uh, chapter four in the Agoras Primer by Samuel Edward Conkin. Uh, whatever service you provide the market, uh, you know best how to counter economize. You know best which regulations to avoid first for the maximum payoffs to risk to the risk ratio. You know which suppliers can be trusted and which cannot. You know which customers to trust and which not to trust. Division of labor, subjective value, and human individuality all contribute to making your case, and everyone else is unique. If you seek or want to want advice on how best to counter economize, you need personal counseling similar to investment counseling. But considering the hundreds of millions of people, many with educational and cultural handicaps, who can economize quite successfully, the challenge is not that great. You need mostly the will to do it. And the psychological and that psychological counter economic will be important as part uh, part cha of chapter eight. Yeah, because we need to get that psychology going, right? Uh, that's the real class warfare. It's the producers, the capitalists, right? The workers and the savers. Producing class versus the political class, the mooching class, right? The institutionalization of the criminal. The mob. The theft, the mob, right? Uh, so we need to have that class consciousness. This is where Marx was right. You know, it is, it is about class warfare. He just got the classes completely wrong, right? Yeah. Completely off. It, it is not the rich against the poor. Or, it's, not the, it's not the capitalist against the labor that's putting society, a productive class, uh, you know, at war with itself. Um, so then he finishes it off here, this chapter. It's undoubtedly easier to extend your counter-economizing when everyone else is doing it. Most people are, but in small but in a small and different ways. Still, if you could win more suppliers and customers over to your trust and get them to counter-economize, they would not only resist turning you in, but they would develop a tendency not to leak secrets and would therefore decrease your risk and increase your payoff both ways. This fact is the driving force towards expansion of the counter-economy. This force is what agorism unleashes against the state. Boom, boom, boom. Bada bing, bada boom. So, yeah, I mean, imagine a world where the black market and the gray market offered uh, protective services, right? Offered, um, you know, these, these things that we, we typically see as, as being status monopolies only. Right, uh, just like people going out and fixing their own, their own, you know, their own roads in the sense of you know, you got a pothole outside your house and you go and fill it up yourself. You know, you don't wait for the state to do it. People are getting fined for doing those things. You know, it's like. Or, or you can always, uh, you know, exchange uh, the, the service for for a service, or uh, you know, have some sort of medium, time, like to, a timeshare, yeah. Or uh, or even, uh, I mean, not everybody's going to take the time to learn how to fill a pothole. Of course, you're gonna have to find some way of hiring a guy to do it, but in a anarch society, so to speak, I mean, if a community needs a road fix, they just you know come together, pretty much potluck their money, you know. To, well, I mean, that's one way that could that it could be done, or there could be you know there could be uh, local businesses that people might hire, or or business that takes care of it on their own. Yeah. You know, you, we won't even have to worry like about the, the neighborhood pays it off. 
uh, pays the business to have a contract with that that neighborhood when the road needs maintenance that come by and fix it. Right. Yeah, definitely. So, and um, you know, just to just to sum it up, I mean, as far as like some controversial points about is this a leg- is this a good enough means to do it? You know, is it effective enough? Because uh, Rothbard had issues with this. He basically, you know, when when Konkin brought up as this as a strategy, Rothbard said, "Well, you know, you'll never have enough money that you can make on the gray market on the black market in order to offer." Um, Counter-economic vehicles, automobiles, for example, or you know, he's basically getting into like more expensive forms of production. Like, sure, you it can work for small things, right? If you're sell, if you're selling uh, tamales or tacos or or hot dogs on the corner, um, or taking care of you know babysitting, homeschooling, doing building websites. Yeah, I mean, for smaller things. But what about higher ends of production, right? What about building cars? What about building jets, right? Building computers. What about mining? Make websites. Um, well, what, yeah, but what about the higher ends of of production? You know, I mean, that's that's that was Rothbard's uh, critique of counter-economic means to achieving a free society. And with with the emergence of Bitcoin, right, of cryptocurrencies, will and the emergence of 3D printers, I think that really does highlight how this uh, this is possible, right? Just, we could have higher ends of of manufacturing and production. So now we have the technology to put it in play. Now we do, we do, and firms have the t- the means by by which they can uh, engage in the uh, in the counter economy, right? They can hide their their gains and their profits in in Bitcoin, in cryptocurrency. So it's a it's a wonderful concept. I mean, we're there, right? The technology is taking us there, whether we want to or not, whether we want to be stateless or not. It's it's taking us there, and we just the quicker we wake up to it, and the quicker we accept this this consciousness that's happening, and Break out of the matrix. Yeah, break out of the matrix. I mean, the quicker we can, uh, we can have another, you know, an, another era, in human development. You know, uh, human prosperity. Yeah, yeah. Just like the transformation from the papists, you know, to the to the enlightenment, and to you know, and from kings to republics, we can have the transition to you know, from from These you know, state we- academics to true, you know, philosophy and. Anarchy. The state, right? The state enforced to volu- voluntary uh, interaction and cooperation, and and anarchy, right? I mean, I mean it's a beautiful. It, yeah, it's it's totally possible, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, we just gotta really work towards more action, you know. Um, stop talking about the problems and let's start, you know, uh, working on the solution. I mean, that's the right. only way we're gonna get out of this uh, this hole of, that the state has created for us. Right, right, right. right. And and right because we need to be consistent, right? This is the point that we. This is why we need to get into counter-economics, because we need to be consistent. If the state is this massive, uh, you know, monolith of a beast that's destroying us, why are we going to give it more revenue and more funds to do it to do so? That makes no sense whatsoever. If the state is is is, is criminal that that needs be resisted, why are we giving away our labor freely to it to such an, a monstrosity? We need to we need to find ways to retain our wealth to to fight the state the size of, of of the encroaching state, find ways to opt out opt out of Wall Street right opt out of the of the banking system. So we'll definitely uh, maybe uh, next episode we'll definitely be covering that we'll fit we'll get all this stuff figured out uh, so we don't have that many cutoffs anymore. So really sorry about that guys and yeah yeah we do apologize for that. Uh, yes we do. Stay tuned. Um you know we'll be back next Saturday. This is the Voluntary Virtues Network. You have been uh, listening to the Agora Underground. Comrade Rick, saluting you in anarchy and peace. And Ladies, y'all, catch you on the flip. Thanks.